morning, everyone. Um, welcome to Dyslexia and Literacy, Oral Language Connections to Reading and Writing. I am Joan Neely McCarthy, and I will be um, your moderator for the day. I've been working with Will Baker and the Dyslexia Foundation for several years to, to design these one-day conferences to bring science to practitioners, to truly make this effort a research to practice, one for children who struggle with reading and literacy. Uh, my daily work is as executive director of the Summit School in Edgewater, Maryland, just outside, outside of Annapolis. And I, and I must tell you that my staff and I benefit all the time from the work of the foundation. I want to welcome educators and parents and sponsor schools. Typically, we would be gathered together in person um, in a beautiful auditorium, and we would be all also live streaming all over the country. But it's a different day and time right now, and we are resilient, so we are all gathered on the grid. Um, but we are very excited to be here and very grateful for MGH Institute to be hosting us with this virtual, virtual webinar. Um, I hope that we have on the grid parents of children who struggle with reading and educators and speech language pathologists, psychologists and social workers and school administrators and medical practitioners. There is something in this conference from anyone who works with or has any connection to children who struggle with literacy. I'm so honored to see such a diversity of people here um, gathered just for the sole purpose of helping children. And the fact that you are here says that you understand our job is to do whatever it takes to help children become literate and to take their place in the world. And the need for us to do something is compelling, it's urgent. TDF hopes that today's experience will help each of you help children who struggle academically, even if it's one child at a time. Each year we cover a topic that's relevant to educators and families and that is cutting edge in nature. We want our participants not only to learn something new, but to begin to think about what they know in an expanded way. That's why we present the neuroscience to set up the day, followed by the strong research that will support the practical application discussed in the afternoon. Today's conference is made possible, as I mentioned, by the Dyslexia Foundation, founded by Will Baker, a very smart, dedicated adult who has dyslexia. Um, he founded this organization to help teachers and families help children learn how to read so they won't struggle in school the way he did. Um, TDF is a nonprofit organization and depends upon member dues and participation in these events. Uh, today, on behalf of Will, I would like to thank Dr. Tiffany Hogan and her research lab manager at MGH Institute, Mary Rasner, for partnering with us and hosting this conference virtually. I also want to recognize Rachel Norton, a graduate student in speech language pathology at MGH Institute for helping with the administrative efforts for today. And I would also like to thank Lauren Jones, who's the executive assistant um, at the Southport School for organizational and administrative support to make this day happen. And finally, I would like to thank our sp sponsors who partner with the Dyslexia Foundation so that these one day conferences can be a re reality. Dr. Bashir has spent a lifetime dedicated to language and learning. He was the director of the speech language pathology department at Children's Hospital in Boston for 25 years. <clears throat> he was the coordinator for academic and disability service for 14 years, the director of the freshman academic studies program for 15 years, as well as associate professor in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at Emerson College. In addition, he has taught in Boston College's Lynch School of Teacher Education for over 40 years. Dr. Bashir is an honored fellow of the American Speech Language Hearing Association, a very, very high honor in our profession. His many years in clinical practice and teaching have led to research interests in the natural history of language disorders, as well as the literacy and self-advocacy needs of students who struggle with language and learning. Along with Dr. Bonnie Singer, he developed the Empower Method for Teaching Expository Writing, um, which we have been using here at the Summit School for 13 years very successfully. The brain frames graphics for supporting language, literacy, teaching and learning, and the qualitative writing inventory. And me and my writing, my students' writing scales for assessing writing. You are in for another treat today. Um, welcome, Dr. Bashir. Unmute myself. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Really nice to see you all. I, I, thank, uh, I thank the morning speakers, Lori and uh, Vince and uh, Ben. 
uh, insightful, applicable, sets up frameworks that I will uh, continue to use. Yes, over my uh, shoulder, you see a teddy bear over there and you see uh, Henrietta, the little stuffed pig. Uh, always there and then up on the corner, there's always the lion there. I'm gonna uh, turn my uh, screen over, I hope. Am I up? Yes, you look, it looks great. Oh, perfect. Okay. Hi. Here we go. Here we go. Let me do an overview with you, which I think is sort of important. I want to make sure that you understand what I mean when I say over language and how language abilities underpin classroom interactions. And what I mean when I say executive functions and what happens to oral language when EFs and self-regulation are reduced or impaired and how are working memory and comprehension then of oral language interwoven? And what are the implications for uh, intervention of all of these? What do I mean when I say oral language? That's what I mean. I mean a, uh, an integrated uh, systemic way of using symbols to represent ideas, messages, and to facilitate uh, human interaction. We move from an understanding of the child's emergence in phonology, which takes about eight years until the eighth year of life to uh, fully mature. Syntax and morphology, the building of sentences, sentences which uh, increase in complexity and length as time goes by, vocabulary and then word relationships and meanings, and pragmatics, that adaptive use of language for purposes of social and contextual uh, response. Uh, many years ago, I believe it was Ignatius Mattingly who came out with the great book called Language by Ear and by Eye. And now we consider language by ear, by eye, by mouth, and by hand. And that becomes really important as we look at this uh, statement of Dr. Courtney Kasdan, Emeritus Professor, Harvard School of Education. She says, the relationship of langu language poses multiple problems for education because it is both curriculum content and the learning environment, both the object of knowledge and a principal means through which other knowledge is acquired. We could spend the afternoon on that quote, but I just want you to note that that's 1973 that she said that, and we are still dealing with the ramifications of the problems that language poses for education. Now, many years ago, we began to study and uh, uh, the uh, relationship of early breaches in language development to later uh, educational and psychological uh, development. And the three points I wish to make about that is, is that preschool children with developmental language disorders are at risk for academic failure, specifically reading, spelling, and writing. And new research shows how that also affects mathematics. Why? Because you are constantly learning language. Being educated is learning language that represents underlying concepts. Let's just take photosynthesis. Let's just take estuaries. Let's just take orbital decay. And underneath each of them, you see a whole world. It's what Maria Montessori would say, I don't teach lessons, I teach language. You learn with language, all classroom interaction, lectures, online is all done with language, speaking, language. And then you learn about language, that meta, which is the basis for phonological awareness, for grammatical awareness, for awareness of the manipulation of ideas, for changing the way one speaks, the situations one adapts to, et cetera. So those three become really uh, anchors in how we begin to understand how language is the curriculum, the way of thinking, thought development, and knowledge. How does language then underpin all of your classroom interactions? Well, here it is, a little overwhelming, but I thought I'd just throw this together. 
if I sit in a classroom and I look at what a teacher is doing and what the students are doing and I mark down in my observation book when I'm looking about a language, uh, a child with language disorders in a, uh, in a classroom, I, I look at these kinds of interactions. Each of these is language-based, cognitive-based, and require executive self-regulatory controls. Inquiry. Social interactions, content learning, such as estuaries, ratios, comprehension of what is said and what is read, especially of disciplinary texts. We heard a bit of that in Laurie's talk this morning in the differentiation between narrative and expository and allocation of executive skills differently in each of these and different brain networks. Discussing what is spoken, heard, read, and written, problem solving, and the role of self-talk as mediating, which I'll return to. Regulating oneself and others. Participating in different learning contexts and routines. Small group discussion, large group discussion. Cooperative learning. Writing across the curriculum and mastery of genres. Learning and participating online constructing ideas, homework strategies, internalization of strategic routines and self-talk mediation, and finally persuasion and argumentation. All of these, as you can see, represent various acts of oral communication that go on in the classroom. Some of these are extended to reading and some to writing, but they make up, if you will, just a small collection of how language and the regulation of language in learning come together smoothly. And we move then when you understand this across a continuum and this continuum will become very important for us because the incursion, uh, the need for uh, executive and self-regulatory control is distributed along a continuum of intentionality and deliberacy. So at one end, you have conversational language, which is casual, very contextualized, all the way up to when you end up with academic language, which is in fact decontextualized and abstract. And along that continuum, there is a differential recruitment of intentionality and therefore, as intentionality increases, there's a recruitment of concomitant executive and self-regulatory functions in order to accomplish it. Let's take, for example, the topic of photosynthesis and the problem of the Roman Empire. In each of these instances, the topics, the content, and the subject matter will require the student to be flexible, work in working memory to hold on to event structures, sequences, be able to remember what is said and let it go in honor of now what is being said, and let's say just to inhibit the intrusion of irrelevant material as they study these two. And notice that the way you would talk about photosynthesis is really quite different than the way you would talk about the invasion of the Roman Empire by the Huns. The talking with close friends, this casual chat, which really doesn't require very much until you start to get into an argument and then it starts to require control. Talking with a parent, talking with the principal, or talking in a group. Each of them begins to recruit us in very specific ways. The casual, the deliberate oral with Mr. Obama here, and the deliberate use of primary source material, in this case, the Declaration of Independence. So that different speaking acts demand varying amounts of executive and self-regulatory control. That is the summarial takeaway at this point in the talk. In fact, exchanging morning greetings, having a casual conversation with a classmate, reporting a playground incident, retelling the plot of Tuck Everlasting or Wonder, giving an oral report on photosynthesis, 
presenting recommendations about bullying to the principal, or debating the roles and responsibilities of the government during a pandemic. You can begin to see that there's a hierarchy here. This hierarchy represents shifts in underlying uh, cognitive frames, schema references, background knowledge, and a deliberate increase in control as you go down the list. So that executive functions then are minimally engaged when responses are practiced, smooth, or automatic. But doing school, however, requires us to act deliberately and with intention all day, every day. Thus participation in school taxes our executive functions. Sometimes uh, I find that teachers will complain that they have to control so much at so many levels simultaneously during the day. And as a consequence, themselves begin to experience a lot of fatigue because you are in fact allocating scarce resources on a continuous basis and having to update constantly what you're doing. So what do I mean then when I say executive functions? Well, let's do it this way. I'm sorry, Vince, it is a man at a control uh, at an airport. I looked for a woman, I couldn't find one, darn it. But inhibiting, we've already heard this this morning, but inhibiting the automatic is what I'm very concerned with. Planning, the what? What do I gotta do here? How am I gonna do it? Oh, I have to, oh God, I've got to hold all this stuff for a while and then I got to do something with the plan. I'm holding the plan. What am I doing? Shifting this cognitive flexibility that we've talked about within a task and between a task. And finally, emotional regulation and the monitoring of self. I think that last one, which I, uh, I will not discuss is really important. I want to bring up the fact that uncertainty has a consequence in uncontrollability, has a consequence for the arising of anxiety. And when you look at the history of many of the students that we are responsible for and engage with, they have a history which is brought forth, birthed, this uncertainty, this anxiety, these movements toward avoidance, toward escape, and how we learn to work with that aspect of affective regulation in the context of our strategic teaching is a challenge for all of us. And often the neglect of it undermines everything else we're doing. executive functions, and notice that S up there, it's always there, that S. There is no such thing as an executive function. There are functions. They do, do not necessarily develop in synchrony. This is very important in teaching because it's very important for you to understand, if you will, that each of these trajectories have a developmental course. They don't all emerge simultaneously and traject simultaneously, they come at different levels. So depending on where you're teaching, what you're teaching, what your expectations are, what kind of assumptions you make, you can violate these trajectories, or you can begin to think in terms of, who is this kid, where is he, what's he demonstrating? Very much like Vince was talking about, being able to come up with a functional analysis of a set of tests, if you will, so that that functional analysis allows you to take what you know about the child and anchor it in a reality about the functioning of the child in a particular kind of context. We'll come back to that contextual importance of this and the forensics of, of dealing with that. Now, this is, uh, this is Martha Denkla. You saw a picture of Martha in, uh, in Vince's presentation. Executive functions plus a developmental language disorder gives rise to a failure to compensate. So children who have one or the other 
is one child. But when you have both of these, there is a real failure to compensate. And that puts you and I in a position of having to be very thoughtful about working in this so-called zone of proximal development, but also working very carefully as we teach in a gradual release model that is highly mentored and then let go of very slowly. So there is a whole process and you'll see it in, in just a moment here. I'm watching my watch. You will see it in, in a moment here. But I would, <clears throat> I would be remiss if I just talked about executive functions. I, I am a student of uh, Bandura's work and uh, particularly of Dr. Barry Zimmerman's work. And it's uh, always been important for Bonnie and I to think in terms of self-regulation. There is a neurobiology, as you've heard this morning, to executive functions. And there is a manifest in self-regulation of these functions. The term then is sometimes subsumed under EFs, but today I'll distinguish these SRs. They consist of a set of behaviors that are used to flexibly guide, notice that little flexibility thing again, monitor and direct the success of one's performance. And they're used then to manage and direct interactions also within the learning environment in order to ensure that success. And here is how we see this whole thing connected that these executive and self-regulatory functions interact with each other, with language and with affect control and regulation. So when EF weaknesses is present, how does it affect spoken expression? Well, it matters quite a bit. I believe it was 1998 when Bonnie and I, Dr. Singer who will come after me, began to share um, an example based on a, uh, a case that we had uh, encountered. Here is Sue, age 12. The idea is in my head, and I can't find the words or hold it all together long enough for me to say what I want. My ideas are like slippery fish. I have my hands on them one moment, and then I've lost it the next. It really is frustrating. I just don't talk in class. Here's, here's RJ. I was this, this boy's therapist for quite a while. RJ's now in his early 40s. <clears throat> he had an, a little island of competence uh, with Dr. Robert Brooks would talk about. And his island of competence was he was very good builder. And by his adolescence, he was contracting uh, tree houses all around his neighborhood, building them. And designing them. Today he has his own design company and often says to me, the best advice you ever gave me was to uh, make sure I surrounded myself with people who could help me control myself and who could uh, put together all the bids for me and read well. This is uh, coming after uh, spring break at school. I say, AB is me. Well, the lightning can happen in the country, can't it? Right, ah, some, yes, that happens too. Is the lightning as scary in the country? Yes, and you know what? Um, um, uh, sometimes, well, we went to Florida, Canut, and, um, and Susan, and that was scary too. We went on an airplane and um, it, was, it was almost scary. I mean, it was scary on the airplane. You had some difficulty on the airplane. Yeah, because you know what? Uh, then it got dark and we couldn't see and, and no, and no, and all the airplanes had the light burned out. Well, that sounds very scary. How did you feel? Yep, the motor um, got some lightning. And then you know what? We got some food on the airplane. And then when there's no, no, no lightning and storm and thunder and lightning and rain, and the lights came back on, I mean, no, it was on. When you were in the plane? Yes, and it was very scary. Notice where he answers the question. Notice how long he's been holding on while he tries to maintain some degree of organization in his conversational turn takings. 
And if you look at it, you see the loss of a verbal economy. You see the extension of stanza in his conversation. And you see how he's really working very, very hard to be able to find language, to keep language organized, and to remember where he is in the conversation with me. And he's trying to update all the way along, which means he's got to hold on to pieces in order to do this. And by the way, the term Anconet is and Connecticut. But it gives you a real insight into a child who's trying to have a conversation with you and you're asking very specific small questions so that you can get an answer out of him that's focused and yet his ability to focus, his ability to maintain narrative integrity, his ab ability to inhibit the intrusion of other ideas that are occurring at the same time and his ability to smoothly shift from one topic to the other, each of them is in fact affected. And it gives rise to what looks like a word salad. When we first began to work with children like this, we had many people say that this looked, that the children probably had other underlying psychiatric disorders that go with it. When the truth of the matter was that these problematic narrative executive interactions give rise to a disorganization. One that looks like the child himself or herself really is scattered. This kid is not scattered, believe it or not. With therapy, with intervention, much of what I will talk to you directly about, you can bring these children into very well-developed narratives. This is the sweet kid who one time, I have to tell you this, even if I eat up my own time, I have to tell you this story. I, I, I once said to him after in this conversation, I said, uh, tell me, is there anybody on the plane who can help you during, you know, when it was uh, such a bumpy ride? He goes, yep. I go, who was it? Was it the captain? He looks at me and he goes, no, stupid. And I looked at him and I said, well, then who is it? He says, you know, She's like the old woman who lives in a sh can. Now, there are those people who might want to say that's a bit schizophrenic. It's not. It's not at all. Because you have to understand that this boy is compensating for his lack of lexical specificity and his inability to actually access lexicons when he needs them. Like the old woman who lived in a can, can only be understood if you understand RJ's favorite food, which was Dinty Moore stew. Now, who is the other person back when this was transcribed who could help you in the plane? She was the stewardess or the stew. And this was his securitous way of trying to maintain his continuous partnership contact with me in a dyadic turn-taking conversation and hold on to the meaning and regulate all the elements. I love this kid. He's grown up. He's really quite successful. He doesn't speak anything like that at all at this point in his life. So here's a 16-year-old self-report. With writing and talking, too much information floods my mind at once. I don't know how to present it in a clear way. I often half bake an argument. My teachers tell me that I make leaps without providing enough details. I have trouble expressing the answer. I have trouble expressing the idea. I feel a block somewhere. I try to do outlines sometimes. It doesn't work. Listen to this carefully now. Talking doesn't help because people don't help me focus. He just unveiled one of your first intervention strategies to you. And this is the clarity of goal setting and planning and selecting language and then being able to visualize and map the thought and then move it on. And that's exactly where I'm going to go with you now. Intervention. This is a... Um, 
this is good for me to be talking about this after this morning when uh, Lori and, uh, and uh, Vince were talking. You know, there's a lot of uh, software out there and uh, a lot of uh, books on helping kids uh, get better working memories and do this and do that. I've never found them helpful in the meta-analyses, the two meta-analyses that uh, Laurie referred to, plus the work of uh, Adele Diamond, whose work has been referred to by Ben and by, uh, by, by Laurie, uh, has really shown that these uh, do not generalize. In fact, they don't generalize to oral communication. So that the work that one does must be grounded in a very careful understanding of what does the task require? What does it mean to talk about something? What does it mean to argue about something? What does it mean to persuade about something? What does it mean to do an interview with someone about a topic? What does it mean to be a talking member of a cooperative learning group and play the roles that are implied in cooperative learning groups? How do I participate in a book discussion? How do I get up and give a book report? These issues uh, show you the range and plethora across which we need to plan and be ourselves flexible in our planning as we begin to scaffold the intervention for the child. So one of the things that's really important is intervention is to help children understand what are the ideas, the thoughts, or the feelings that they want to, that I want to share. Notice here that I use that I want to share. This is important to us because we are in the business of transferring agency. We will scaffold and release the scaffolds and carry you through that gradual release model, but we're doing it in the pace we need to do it so that your internalization of it will be gradual, but be complete and lead you to become independent and self-regulated. So the I is intended to keep the notion of agency, doability, centered within the, the student. So establish the attainable goal. What, what ideas or thoughts or feelings do I want to share? And choose to use an effective strategy to achieve that goal. What rhetorical patterns are required to say what I want to say? And you're not going to use what rhetorical patterns are required, you know, but that's me, sorry. You're going to be saying something like, when I'm going to pose an argument, what are the requirements I'm going to need? to fulfill an order for this argument to be well proposed or persuasion. But you're gonna look for the effective strategy and often the child has no strategy. That's where you and I come in. That's where the teacher comes in, scaffolding it, modeling it. I think uh, Ed Ellis's uh, uh, approach to, uh, Ed is at the University of Alabama I studied with him, I studied with uh, strategic teaching with Don Deschler and with Gene Schumacher in Kansas. And I think one of the things they would always say is, is that in giving children strategies, what we're really giving them is a deeper sense of their ability to achieve this on their own, independent of us, with always remembering that they have the recourse to us. And so it is this gradual release model. And strategies, are important because they have a language in them. Um, and that language that's in them helps you internally self-mediate once you acquire that language. Because what's the other language? I can't do this. There are too many thoughts in my head. What's that language? What did that kid say? 
It's too much. I can't get the outline, man. I'm trouble expressing this answer. I'm blocking somewhere. Where is it? I often have to bake an idea. I mean, I, what am I going to do here? So you have a kid who knows something about themselves. And that these situations always set up a kind of anticipatory anxiety. Oh, here it comes again. I got to do this again. No, as you begin to build the alliance, and that alliance is really critical, you begin to, the child begins to know that you have unconditional positive regard for them and that you're not there judging them. What you're there doing is building a collaborative partnership and helping them walk out of the woods one day at a time. And so these explicit strategies that we give kids are really intended to replace a rather chaotic, negative self, um, how do I want to, I, I want a word. Uh, at my age, I can't get to words, it's part of the aging process. Um, I can't do it, it's okay. Uh, the, you want to give them something that allows them to replace the negative voice within them with a voice of hopelessness, and with a, a voice of hopefulness and possibility. I, I'm used to saying that when the child leaves you, leave your voice with the child. Because in the midst of the internal narratives that children often develop for themselves, this other voice, the voice of the teacher, the voice of the therapist, can come and act as an introject in such a way that it helps the child move through the option available. And here is how we help them begin to move through that. Uh, at the end, I'll show you uh, work that Bonnie and I did with, with one child and the way we set up his, uh, his constant self-mediation in these areas. What strategies can I use to organize my thoughts? Which really means how can I plan and organize this presentation? And what graphics can I use to scaffold my thoughts? Well, aren't we getting down here to really explicit teaching about this notion of can I, can I see my thoughts? And that's where this all began. It began by helping students in a philosophy class, when I was running a writing center, start seeing their thoughts. And that has evolved over the year through Bonnie's genius into brain frames. But these, this is a way we sit down and begin to map, externalize, so that I don't have to hold on to everything while I think about everything and make decisions about choice. It's right in front of me. I'm developing it as I go. It's an evolving process, not a terminal process. It's evolving. And I can use the mapping within the frameworks of plan and organize to begin to help me get a hold of that idea, not worry about going to an outline yet, map it. And boy, some of the maps can be quite an interesting thing. I'm, I'm sure John, Joan could uh, pull a few up from her school for you about what these maps uh, look like and so could Ben. But it's very important for us to understand that we're trying to help the child clear away the fog, be able to come out of themselves, be able to look at what's in front of them and be able to engage with planning and organizing. You see, what we're doing is trying to take what we know from the research about executive functions and self-regulation, and we're trying to concretize it in practices that mentor the child so that they're gradually, to the extent possible, internalized, and then moved toward, again, transfer of agency. It's a, like a mantra of mine, but nah, sorry about that. And then we ask for self-monitoring and self-evaluation. What can I do to monitor what I'm saying? And how is it being received by my listener? Wow, all of a sudden we're into a meta. We're into this meta linguistics. We're into meta. We're looking at me. I'm taking a look at me. I'm taking a look at myself as functional. I'm saying to myself, do you remember what you were talking about? Do you know where you're going? Have you, are you going down a blind alley? Where, where are you going? What are you doing? 
I'm stuck. Why am I stuck? Where did I go? And why are they looking at me that way? What, what kind of information is that? So you're getting these enormous data points for self-reading and reading from the outside in, which leads you to the next point. What do I need to change to be understood? And then in this, staying with it and easy does it are really hard because they really represent that I have to be able to what? Hold some quantum of anxiety while I do this work. And if I can't hold that quantum of anxiety, it'll, dis it'll just be like wildfire through my executive and self-regulatory functions. And I'll walk away. I won't do it. I'll develop a stomach ache. Any one of a number of things can begin to happen. So we have to work there in that alliance that we have with the child, that all the way along the way, we have ways of explicitly acknowledging the child's situation and showing the child that we're all right with it, we're there with them, and we're going to keep there. And then here are some things we might be able to do. Let's, let's take a break. Let's walk away from this a minute. Let's, uh, let's do something, you know? On a tape I was watching recently, the mother said to the kid, you did a beautiful job with this. I know it was tricky for you. She didn't say, I know it was hard for you. She said, I know it was tricky for you. So why don't you go out and ride your bike for five minutes and come on back in. The kid did, he comes right back in. In other words, seek support from other people and resources, and I will use social and environmental supports proactively. Ask for help, the hardest thing in the world. I'm supposed to be an expert. Now I gotta ask for help. The hardest thing in the world for a kid. Okay, so I'm show you how we can concretize this just so that we can look at some self-guiding questions. Let me look at my watch. Okay. This, uh, this came from, um, um, I think we, we wrote about this case when we wrote about what does executive and self-regulatory functions have to do with language, language disorders. But we became very, uh, very concerned that the, the, the student is with us for a very short period of time and with themselves for a very long period of time. And we need to be able to provide the student with interventions that allow their internalization so that when they're not with us, they're with us. And that sense of collaboration and liaison and rapport is all there. And so with this client, real situations are used to do what I was talking about back here. And this is just a piece of that work, just a piece, not the whole, the whole of it. What do I wanna say? That's the kid learns. What do I wanna say here? I wanna compare the characters of Jay Gatsby and Nick Carraway and the Great Gatsby. Remember that goal? Remember that goal? There it is. Okay, what do I wanna do? I wanna do this, I wanna compare. Now notice compare is a really different word than describe. Notice it's a different word than discuss. This word compare already tells you something about what this strategies are that I'm gonna to have to choose and develop a plan and organize is all about because it's for compare. It's not for persuade, it's not for argument. The genres become critical in the way goals are set and then the elements of language and thinking and regulation are recruited to achieve that genre. What kinds of thinking do I need to do? I need to describe the characters and I need to tell how they are alike and my typo, sorry, and how they are different from each other. Okay, he's got, he's got on the framework. It's okay, 
So he can get about describing the characters and then he can take that and find the similarities and the differences between these characters. And what can I do to help myself plan and organize the material? Use my graphic. I need to visualize the structure of my speech and decide how to organize the information about the characters. Okay. And how will I monitor my speech during my presentation? I'm speaking too fast. I need to use my pacing strategy to slow down so that I have more time to explain myself. He's learned every one of these, uh, I'm speaking too fast in his intervention because there's been a critique of, there's a critique of my speech with my clients, especially for those of you who are out there who are SLPs, if you're working uh, with a client who has a, um, a problem, let's say in stuttering, uh, you're always working to begin to provide um, uh, the meta-awareness of the performance aspects of oral communication. Here the kid is already knows that he talks too fast. He talks too fast as a part of his whole regulatory problem. I need to use my pacing strategy. It's a strategy we showed him how to use to slow down so that I have more time to explain myself, so I'm buying time, see? I'm getting lost, what am I trying to say? This, uh, this client was talking uh, about in a mock interview that he was uh, gonna go to college and right in the middle of uh, the practicing uh, interviews for, for university, uh, he said something and he knew that he was lost. And you could visually see him stop himself, use a placeholder, gather himself up, start again, and move straight through it. What changes can I make so that I am sure to be understood? What I need to do is change how I'm talking by slowing down my rate, pausing to give myself time to come up with the right words. I can buy time by saying, wait, I need to say that again, or by that I mean, and we worked with this con. Bonnie uh, was with this uh, young man all the way through law school because different contexts demand different regulatory functions on oral communication. This young man won the mock trial contest at his law school. And uh, always touches my heart to think about this guy. He's grown up now, he's married. I think he has his own children and practicing, but always makes me think about how much this young man taught us about the relationship between oral communication and executive self-regulatory functions. And I just wanna take it from a completely different point of view. Here's an insect report schedule. It's an external executive drive. It's a teacher teaching in a thematic unit, lays out for her kids a syllabus. Week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, week six. And lays it out for them in such a way that they always know where they are. It always helps them. It's an external regulator, if you will. I love it. Choose the insect you want to study. Write down materials available in the library. Read and begin writing down facts. Okay. And she can, she literally, this is a, a fourth grade, by the way. She literally um, would break down each of these into um, very explicit uh, lesson plans and activities within each of those uh, lesson plans. I finished that unit and I've given myself a little bit of time to talk about uh, EF weaknesses and listening comprehension. Well, we heard a lot about it uh, this morning. Lori's beautiful taking of the Scarborough uh, trajectories in the simple model of reading, uh, where she wove in the orange line uh, for, um, for executive functions. Uh, Dr. Singer had done that years ago in, a, in an overhead and uh, just showed people how the EF was in fact a part of reading comprehension. Well, you know, it's a part of listening comprehension. 
the components of comprehension are very, very, um, very important. Most people think comprehension is about vocabulary. Blunt. They teach vocabulary and think they're teaching comprehension. You're not. The key, and you'll see this in Dr. Hugh Katz's most recent article in the uh, in Reed Ray's magazine, Remedial and Special Ed. I believe it was 2018 in which he talks about the simple uh, model of reading comprehension, and then um, really talks about. Uh, the critical importance of background experiences and background knowledge, facts, concepts, internal encyclopedia on this entire comprehension process. Comprehension is grounded in the background. It's grounded in those mental models you and I have. If you could see me and I could hold up my hand with my fingers splayed, you could see through my fingers and that is what we do. We see through the language to the, the, uh, the, the mental model we have. And then, of course, there is the semantic and the semanticity, vocabulary, breadth of knowledge of that. Very important. And above all, as Bonnie will talk about, there are syntactic and morphological knowledge. Many kids who can read can't read along story because they can't manage the memory tasks they can't manage the complexities and bonnie will talk to you about that and genre knowledge there are five major genres outside of narrative and expository and then what the shanahan's have talked about from the university of chicago that is disciplinary literacy and disciplinary literacy has to do with uh, science, for example, or history or philosophy, uh, where specific uh, disciplines organize their materials in a literate manner uh, different from each other. Uh, Dr. Catherine Snow of Harvard has a wonderful article that appeared in Science uh, a number of years ago. Um, I, I can't give you the reference because I, I, I don't remember it, but it was in the journal Science, in which uh, she wrote an article on reading science, and it was a very um, elucidated article of the multiple processes that come together when we go into reading disciplinary dense material. And EFs, and they're the ones, inhibition, working memory, affect regulation, and flexibility. I didn't put that on there, but that's the one everybody used this morning, and it's the one I've, I've got right now. So let's look at this. The sentence processing can be difficult because of the grammatical structures, that's to say the syntax, or trying to generate meaning from the incoming text or from the incoming speech. You can have a hard time understanding what's going on. And here's a model by Van Dich and Kinch. Uh, Kinch was referred to earlier this morning uh, with Dr. Uh, um, uh, I think Perfetti. And here's where we're talking about simultaneous processes. Uh, this, is, this is going to look like as silos, but it really is reciprocal. And the listener or the reader is moving through these up and down to different degrees at different times and different requirements. If it's speech, it's online processing, real time. Reading allows you to keep the text in front of you, speaking. It's gone. Everything I said at two o'clock is over. I have seven minutes left. And in seven minutes, it will be gone. And at three o'clock, at two o'clock, everything I said will be gone. And by tomorrow, you'll have to refer to your notes. Because it's just the way online speech is and why it's so hard to comprehend. Some of us are not fast processors. We process slowly. We hold on to material differently. And the push of the curriculum, the having to acquire, often forces us to bring about breakdown because of the rate at which material is delivered and expected to be learned. Online processing is quite tricky. Understanding, interpreting, and infer inferring meanings and intentions 
and the construction of an elaboration of mental and inhibition working memory and emotional regulation. So there they are. You've heard them by now. There's no need for me to, to go over them at the little bit of time. I'd like to leave some time for questions. We do know that there's a high degree of overaction and these uh, three uh, related uh, circles here help us begin to see what's common in the way this works. And what's common in the way it all works is working memory limitations. It's all over the place. And working memory is a problem of storing and manipulating information in service to accomplishing a task. I wish to clarify that from all that we've said today. It is in service to accomplishing a task, not just following directions, but it's listening to complexity and holding on to parse chunks of it so that at some point you're able to recruit their meanings to construct the entire meaning of that complex sentence but it has very short duration. It's gone. For example, if I said to us and gave us a quiz and said the DMN network versus the FPN network, what are the differences in narrative and expository text as demonstrated by Dr. Cutting this morning? Bingo, you can see immediately how that works. And your limited capacity, three to four chunks, everybody, Three to four chunks, that's not a lot. That's not a lot. It is both bolstered by store knowledge because the more you know, the better off you're gonna be in remembering. Easier to remember what you know or have a base for than it is brand new information. School is filled with brand new information. And it's attention dependent. Okay, so your capacity to meet the demands vary as a function of the demand itself. And that's something I really want to give you today is this demands capacity model. It's not a causational model, but it's a way for you and I to look at a child and how that child is having difficulty. Why it's breaking down for that child. And we say, what does the task demand and what does the child bring to this task at this moment? And how does that help us understand the breakdown? It's a concept that comes out of Woody Starkweather's work for years uh, with individuals who, uh, who stutter. But it is also a very important concept that we can bring into asking the question of how is working memory diminished here, attenuation, attending uh, fluctuated, background knowledge limited. He's still acquiring school language, fatigue, any number of variables can bring about this. That's why so much of what we do and understand has to be functionally contextualized. And that's why a forensics approach becomes so important to you and I as we take all the data and then take the environmental experience with the child and then take the contextual and begin to use it to help us tease out what factors need to come together in a solid linkage to really help this kid in this situation right now. So there's no silver bullet. Sorry. It all varies. And the varies a function of task demands and the child's capacity. So this is collaborative problem solving. And I think I'll just skip that one. No, I won't. Because working memory is constantly demanded during language production and discourse comprehension. It requires continuous holding, chunking, refreshing, updating, and consolidating. All those tasks are involved in those acts of discourse comprehension, reading comprehension, oral language production, even writing a paper. Bonnie and I subscribe to a complex intervention model. There is no silver bullet. This model says, that the intervention is made up of many individual components that work synchronously and in conjunction with each other to bring about the desired outcome. In complexity, less complexity, easy to hard variables. So what are the working memory demands of the language task? We ask it. 
Does the student have the requisite knowing to manage the task? Background knowledge, cognitive reasoning, language. Does the way in which the information is presented need to be modified in order to support the student's success? Adjusting your speaking rate, simplifying semantic, maybe bootstrapping and syntactic complexity, teaching parsing and sense making in the use of the intuitive. Our, our interpersonal supports needed to assist the student in compensating for working memory limitations. Repetition, uh, redundant uh, presentation, uh, visual anchors, lexical emphasis, guiding questions. Our changes in the environment needed to enhance the student's success, decreasing background noise, re reorient, falling an interruption in the class. Somebody comes in the class while you're talking. Bingo. Half the kids remember it and the rest of the kids look at you and don't remember where they were. That's my guy in the middle, I'll tell you that. And limiting visual distractions. All of those are ways in which you can begin to ask key questions. Bonnie and I ask ourselves all the time these questions. And they came out in a, they're, it's all amplified uh, in an article that came out in Language, Speech and Hearing Services and Schools in July of 2018, Dr. Ron Gillum uh, put together a symposium in that journal on working memory and it's uh, language, speech and hearing services in schools, uh, 2018, July, I believe, I'm not sure. So it's, uh, it's uh, oh God, I, two minutes. Okay, that makes the point. And thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bashir. Uh, such an amazing uh, presentation with so many practical insights. Uh, there are a few questions, and we ha I think we'll try to get to a few of them before we take our break. The first one is, can you talk about the types of strengths that you would use with a high school student versus an elementary student? Do you have an opinion on how current events affect a student's working memory by increasing their anxiety? Yeah, you see, the, the key there is to understand the anxiety uh, so that you can get to the strategies that are going to make sense. This is where, uh, you know, working with high school students, I, uh, I review their neuropsychs with them after I've reviewed them with a neuropsychologist. I help interpret them. I literally interpret them in terms of this would help us understand why that is happening. In other words, I give them some insights into themselves based upon what's going on. And I have lots of conversations with them where I ask for clarifying of my understanding. Do, do I understand correctly? Is, is this how this is uh, working for you or not working for you? And they see you as engaged um, uh, with them in a collaboration to unpack this. They also understand that you understand that they're not stupid, that you understand that they have a particular kind of way of thinking and approaching an issue, and that you're here to help unpack that and then to elaborate with them and to enhance their approach to problem solving. That's really hard to do before you get to a meta personal, metacognitive uh, stage of development. So doing that with a third and fourth grader is particularly tricky, but doing that with a, an older kid is not. It, uh, uh, I, I, a quick story, I, uh, this kid is a great soccer player, but he can't write, save his life. And uh, the teacher said, write a piece in history about the history of something. Well, I said to him, why don't we write a piece on the history of soccer? He said, look, my feet know all about it. My mind doesn't know anything. I said, well, let's have your feet teach your mind. Let's go out on the field. Bingo, we played soccer. I don't play soccer, uh, I play rugby. Uh, I don't play soccer, uh, but he taught me how to play soccer. And as he was doing that, boy, did we put it together. So it's a, it's a matter of engagement and uh, opening up to the truth of what this is about, helping the kid explore it, uh, keeping that unconditional acceptance of the child, and really working from a forensics point of view, and then nailing in the, um, in the strategies and constantly saying, how is this going? What is this doing for you, et cetera? How would you like to modify it? I hope I answered your question. Absolutely, and this is so apropos today um, is DLD or Developmental Language Disorder Awareness Day. 
and the Zakem Bridge will be lit up tonight in purple and yellow in Boston. And there's over 45 monuments across the world that will be lit up today to bring awareness to exactly what you're speaking of. And it's just such an honor to hear you today. It, it, very important on this day. And also the governor of Massachusetts, Governor Baker signed a proclamation to uh, make today DLD Awareness Day for the state of Massachusetts. So this is just such important work to be discussing today and especially acknowledging that uh, developmental language disorder and dyslexia have such an overlap and how important executive function is and anxiety. So thank you so much, Dr. Bashir. And uh, we just have really enjoyed listening to you.